So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Art Linfanti. I'm the uh, chairman of the New Jersey chapter of the uh, Councillors of Real Estate. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, that's uh, attending our uh, our webinar uh, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you're wherever you're located. Um, today is uh, is the second in our series of webinars that we've put together over the last couple of months. And, uh, and today's topic is, uh, of course, uh, everyone's favorite topic, or I guess the topic of the year, which is COVID-19. But in this case, we're gonna be talking about the uh, impacts on planning and designs. A lot of discussion these days about what uh, the world is gonna look like uh, uh, you know, after this pandemic uh, subsides or what's gonna happen while it's still going on. Um, our moderator today is uh, Keenan Hughes, a planner with uh, Phillips Price at uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, and he has uh, several uh, very distinguished speakers with him today, uh, Brad Bowler, uh, Roger Smith, and Dave Lustberg. I'm going to uh, uh, allow Keenan to take over the program at this point and, uh, and provide some introduction and some background of what we're going to be hearing for the next hour. So Keenan, it's all yours. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you, Art. Um, and I also want to thank Paul Cody and his team in Chicago for helping to coordinate this event and make it uh, available to members across the country. Um, my name is Keenan Hughes. I'm a principal with Phillips Price, which is a planning and real estate consulting firm based in Hoboken. Uh, I'm going to lead things off here with some introductory remarks. Um, and then we're gonna have each of our panelists make a presentation. Uh, our goal is to wrap things up by about two o'clock. Um, and we're also hoping to leave a few minutes at the end for some questions uh, from the audience uh, for a little bit of discussion. So to that end, we would encourage you uh, during the course of the presentation, if you have a question, feel free to submit that via the Q&A function um, on Zoom. Um, so, the pandemic has obviously changed how we interact with each other and with our environments. And the general theme of this afternoon's discussion is how um, it has impacted and what implications that has for physical planning and design. Um, and certainly a persistent question related to all of this is, you know, how much of this is short term versus what permanence uh, will some of these changes have? Um, I think we've assembled a, a good panel of experts here to help us address these issues. Um, and certainly one of the most transformational aspects of the pandemic has been how it's forced us to rethink where and how we work. Um, and this will undoubtedly impact the future of our physical work, work environments. We have with us this afternoon Roger Smith, who is an architect uh, to discuss workplace design. Um, he also has some very exciting new data to share. Roger is the design director for architecture at Gensler's Morristown, New Jersey office. He has over 30 years of experience with a broad range of projects from master planning and mixed use developments to corporate office buildings, housing, museums, and hotels. He's worked around the world and he's currently working on a number of major projects throughout New Jersey including the repositioning of the Gateway Center in downtown Newark. Um, he has also been adjunct professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology, Kane University, and the Weizmann School of Design at UPenn, where he received his master's degree in architecture. The pandemic has also, um, interestingly, allowed communities to experiment with how we use our public streets and spaces. Uh, which will surely have some permanent impacts. And in many communities that have been able to quickly adapt to this new reality, we've seen some incredible street life. I think all of us have observed that in our own communities. Um, and furthermore, we're starting to see how some of these concepts can also be used to activate office parks, retail environments, and other private spaces. And to discuss this particular issue, we have David Lustberg, he is a landscape architect, planner, and urban designer with over 20 years of diverse professional experience. He is the founding partner of Arterial, which is a Montclair, New Jersey-based urban design firm that he founded in 2009. And Arterial specializes in creating active and engaging pedestrian spaces and high-performance streets. 
We've also obviously seen significant disruptions to commercial real estate in particular, uh, retail, office. Uh, we've seen in, in some ways the acceleration of the demise of brick and mortar retail, at least in some sectors. Um, and many places are now left uh, with an over retailed environment. Um, we have with us Brad Bowler, who's a civil engineer and a principal with Bowler Engineering, who has over 15 years of experience in all aspects of land development, including industrial, commercial, and residential projects to discuss how these changes are impacting site design uh, for commercial users. So um, just by way of wrapping up some introduction here, uh, as a planner, I find that many of the planning and design challenges that are posed by the pandemic are really not necessarily new, at least when you think about the built environment, but they've highlighted that our most resilient communities and places are the ones that have been best able to adapt to our current uh, circumstances. These are the ones that possess the qualities of, of great urban places, great places generally. What does that mean? Well, human scaled walkable places that have public gatherings and parks um, has, has become incredibly important. Um, I don't know about you, but I've never seen so many people walking um, and it's never been as important to have uh, public spaces, parks uh, within a reasonable distance from home for social interaction, for recreation, et cetera. Uh, likewise, having flexible and diverse mixed use environments, those are the places that have been best able to adapt to the challenges that we're facing now. Single user, you know, more purpose-built, environments um, have many more challenges in terms of overcoming the challenges that we're facing. Also, when you're working remotely, the neighborhood becomes everything. Um, and even as we look ahead to a post-pandemic world, if you're working from home or working remotely one or two days a week under sort of a hybrid model, you're still gonna need proximity to retail, entertainment, workspaces outside of your home um, and accessible outdoor spaces. So you need these things uh, within a reasonable distance. That doesn't mean a 30 minute commute into an urban center. So I think that has some exciting ramifications for um, our neighborhoods and a lot of potential for additional revitalization for areas outside of our major employment centers. And then finally, just ensuring that equitable access is to provided to spaces and places that have these attributes um, has to be a priority of public policy moving forward. So again, these are not new concepts, but these are the qualities that have allowed our cities and our towns to adapt to unforeseen challenges really since their creation. And I think now uh, we're seeing these principles being adapted to varying degrees to our office parks, to our retail centers, to our single family neighborhoods to make all of these places more resilient. Um, and for communities and for real estate owners, long-term planning that provides a vision for the future that integrates these principles and can help guide public policy in these uncertain times is, is critically important. So with that as a backdrop, um, let us hear from Roger Smith. Okay, thank you, Keenan. I'll try to get my screen on here. Okay, um, the COVID-19 crisis clearly has touched us all. There's no doubt about it, as Keenan says. Um, it has dramatically impacted the way we live, the way we work, the way we play. Um, and I'd like to take a few moments to discuss a few ideas that we have about the future of office buildings and the future of workplace as we move beyond this crisis, which we certainly will do at some point. Uh, there's no doubt that we will not be using space in the same way communal areas, density, hygiene, operation, and workflow solutions will, not, will certainly not be the, the same moving forward. Since the beginning of this crisis, Gensler's conducted a, a number of roundtables, uh, a number of surveys, and we've engaged our clients to better understand these rapidly changing times. It's been an important asset to sort of understanding where we're going. When we return to the office, what will that new experience be? How will it support new ways of working? 
uh, we wanted to answer these questions is kind of understand it. And we ran a work from home survey with 2,500 2, respondents in mid April, mid May, uh, in order to try to understand a little bit more about this. And what we learned uh, that contrary to what had been reported in the news, 75% uh, of the people that we that responded um, uh, said that the office, uh, they wanted to come back to the office most of the time. Out of that 70%, 44% uh, wanted to work um, from the office, uh, wanted to work from the office full time. And as you can see, only 12% um, wanted to work from home, which is a bit of a surprise. We ran the same survey in September and are analyzing that data now, but the preliminary findings are consistent um, with the initial survey. And we're seeing that the longer people work from home, the more they appear to be adapting and would prefer a kind of hybrid model for the workplace. You know, they say it takes about 66 days to form a new habit. Uh, and we've been working from home for over eight months. So uh, things are definitely changing. We thought it would be the, the sort of baby boomers who would have the most difficulty working from home. Uh, but to our surprise, millennials and the Gen Z generations are having the most difficulty working from home. It's not only because of their living conditions, but they need mentoring. They need impromptu interaction with their teams. They feel more stress at the end of the day uh, and they get less done. A majority of US workers prefer a hybrid model of splitting their time in the office and at home and possibly other remote places. Uh, from pre-COVID trends that existed, um, they were already taking place to the responses that we're seeing now in this current moment. And looking forward, it is clear that the role of the workplace is changing. The past nine months has enabled us to accelerate the use of technology, to explore different ways of working. And there are a number of questions that we've, we've been asking. Uh, why go back to the office? How do we reimagine the workplace for the future? Will corporate America need more or less space? And what are the new expectations for the office building? These are all very important questions. Prior to COVID-19, we were seeing shifts affecting our office and work and workplaces that included a focus on amenities uh, that connect people, enhanced level of choice for employees in office buildings. Uh, we were approaching a kind of plateau as it relates to densification in office places, office spaces. Um, there was an increase, um, there was an increase uh, in interest in enabling technologies and, and we're beginning to see a growing focus on wellness and sustainable design. Very, very, very active trends that were already in place in 2019. 2020 has been quite a year, of course. And during the, the COVID-19 crisis, we've seen an acceleration of that change. And we've seen a refocus on the role, the actual role of the office place and the very, uh, the very nature of workplace. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really a transformational period for us. As I hinted earlier, a kind of new hybrid model is emerging and we will need to strike a balance between what we've gained from working from home and what we've lost uh, by, being, by not being in the workplace. For example, working from home has allowed a certain amount of flexibility to plan around, to plan around our needs at home and to, and to balance that against uh, the responsibilities we have at the office. That's been very uh, important to a lot of people. On the other hand, many people say um, they need time away from home and they need a, a bit of time away from family. Um, the daily stresses of community, uh, of commuting have been eliminated, but now, um, now many re realize that they've, they've lost that me time that they had during the commute. So these are questions and there are many, many others that we're, we're grappling with to kind of understand what the, what the future is. In our uh, most recent Gensler workplace survey, you can see that 29% of our respondents uh, wanted to work uh, in the office full time, while about 19% wanted to work at home for the full time. Uh, but the bottom line is the majority of US, uh, US workers, about 52%, would prefer a flexible hybrid model. So the question is, you know, what does that future hold for the workplace? 
You know, I think, and we think that people need to be together. We think that place matters. And this is why we will return to the office. Here are six ideas that we've been thinking about uh, regarding the future of workplace. And I'd like to share them with you. First, the workplace will need to be flexible and adaptable. It will become a new social connector. It will be important to create new distinctive experiences as well to draw people into the workplace. Um, amenities will become destinations, you know, more than just amenities or offerings, but destinations. There will be a focus on wellness. Um, we've already seen that trend and it's even been, it's been further accelerated today. And finally, distributed real estate models are likely to emerge as we move forward. So first flexibility and adaptability have been drivers for workplace planning for years. Uh, it has become, it because has become more critical, uh, not just in the short term, but also in the long term due to the rapidly changing nature of work. We believe that we will see smaller neighborhood groups within walk uh, office floor plans that can easily and quickly be reconfigured uh, to accommodate increasingly changing business demands. So no doubt we'll see that. We'll see um, the creation of more flexible spaces within our workplaces that can be used for different purposes and for a variety of needs. Another idea that we've been looking at is this idea of the social connector, a combination of in-person presence and digital information encouraging spontaneous interaction. The space should provide a kind of different look and feel and should en enable more a kind of more informal experience. And in many ways, it can be seen as a kind of convergence of both hospitality and residential within a, a corporate office setting. At 200 Connell Drive, we blended this sort of residential and hospitality look and feel to create new places for social connection interaction, and interaction within the, the spaces of the building. There will also be spaces that we need to provide that are distinctive and have experiences that draw people into the workplace. We believe that the post-pandemic environment is no longer uh, a single place, but a collection of connected physical and digital spaces combined. These spaces will be flexible, as I said, use, uh, uh, used for informal work as well as entertaining clients and employees. At Campari, uh, the workplace bar that we designed becomes a unique focal point for workers as an extension of the workplace, but also for clients. Initially, we thought that uh, amenities were, were losing ground and, and that people would not uh, be able to get close to each other again, but that's not the case. As a matter of fact, this is the major reason why people may come back to the office, to connect, to learn, to embrace the culture, to build trust with each other. So we believe we will see an increase in amenity spaces throughout office uh, buildings uh, as destinations, as real focal points for the office. At the new Gateway Center um, in Newark that we're, we're is about to be under construction, um, uh, there are 1.6 million square feet of office buildings that will be connected uh, to the reimagined, reinvigorated retail concourse that connects them and becomes a new destination, not only for the workers in that community, but for the community itself. And one of the biggest impacts of the pandemic on the office building has been the shift in attitude towards wellness. Health and hygiene are more important than ever. The Well Building Institute will be very busy, I think, in the next several years. Um, healthier, safer buildings will be an outcome of this pandemic. Corporations and landlords will measure, monitor, display environmental conditions in real time to give a comfort level and confidence to the employees and the tenants, and frankly, to quickly address any issues that may arise. Our um, M station um, uh, project in Morristown that's uh, about to uh, break ground, uh, put a premium on the creation of outdoor space by creating a, a linear park, uh, nearly 50 feet long, uh, deep, and the full length of, of the, three, the two buildings on the site in order to enhance the sense of well-being and to create outdoor spaces for people to enjoy. These outdoor spaces, of course, will be more and more important in the, in the coming years. 
And finally, uh, we may see a more distributed uh, real estate uh, market. The crisis and the ability to work from home has accelerated a trend that we've seen happening for the last uh, eight years or so. And even before the crisis, we saw that the high price of living uh, was driving millennials and young, young families out of our, our gateway cities. And some co corporations like Barclays uh, to suburban New Jersey uh, from New York City. So these are, these are some of the trends that we've seen. This is where we think it's going. And we certainly see the crisis as a challenge, but we also see it as an incredible opportunity for innovation. And we're very, very optimistic about the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roger. Now we'll go to, to David for his presentation. All right, that was excellent. Um, thank you, everyone. Can you see my screen? Someone give me a nod there. Yes. Got it. <clears throat> All right, perfect. All right, well, that was great. And so I'm gonna speak now a little bit about uh, streets and public space and how that was impacted um, uh, by COVID and, and some of the shifts that, that we're seeing. You'll see a lot of common themes uh, from what Roger just presented that weave their way uh, through the site design. Um, a lot of these ideas, as, Ro as uh, Roger mentioned, um, they're not entirely new ideas. They're trends that were starting prior to COVID-19 and COVID-19 has now accelerated those ideas or places that had already adapted to those ideas uh, thrived maybe a little bit better during COVID-19. So uh, first I'm gonna start with site design uh, for, for modern office parks, and then I'm gonna move into public space and streets. So site design for the modern office park, um, spoiler alert, it's, it's not about parking spaces. Um, parking still is very important, but the shift is now moving to what else can we do with all of that space uh, outside of the buildings. So uh, four trends that we're seeing, uh, enhancing connectivity. So treating office parks more like a campus. Two, designing the experience. There's a real emphasis on uh, people's experience while they are um, you know, navigating a, a, a place. Uh, focusing on health and wellness, as, as Roger had just mentioned, and then maxim using this space to maximize amenities and programming. So first, um, enhancing connectivity. Uh, so this is the Capital One campus in Richmond, Virginia. This is an image showing uh, robust pedestrian networks. This is, uh, we're trying to integrate this on all of the campuses. Uh, so not just creating sidewalks, but creating interesting paths that are connecting the key destinations and giving pedestrians lots of options. Shared transportation systems. So integrating bike share, scooter share, things like this. So people at lunchtime can get around the campus and utilize these amenities that you're spreading out throughout the campus. And finally, balancing the streets and the road networks. You know, traditionally corporate campuses, the roads were designed for cars. And, you know, this image here is probably, you know, where we've all seen this campus drive with the large median and very car oriented. But what we're starting to do is look at that space. And if we were to take that arrow that you see along the top and push it one tick over and make this slightly more about mobility, uh, we reduce the median and we provide some really nice pedestrian space and really nice uh, cycling tracks and things like this. If we push that arrow further over, we really start to amenitize that area using the same amount of space. And then finally, if we push it all the way over, um, we end up with you know, a really strong park, public space system um, and, and starting to balance uh, how those streets function. So uh, this is something that we're seeing uh, you know, a lot of focus on and a lot of reconsideration. Next, it's about designing the experience. You know, people coming into these office parks, they're really used to working in downtowns and in urban areas. So now what, it's, what we're seeing is that office parks are starting to want to redesign to provide that downtown experience. And this is an example, uh, this is Bellworks uh, here in New Jersey. And right here on the website, what the quote is, it's full of everything you find in a great downtown. So this, you know, I thought that was interesting. It's just a great way of showing uh, where that trend is moving. 
And what does that mean? Well, street level activation, right? A great downtown has an active street. So rather than, you know, a walled off uh, street, we want a place where people can walk and interact with the building, interact with each other. And there's a real outdoor experience. Um, engaging architecture. So really interesting architecture, things to look at, things to experience. So those are the two key things we think about this when we're designing the experience. Third, focusing on health and wellness. And Roger really underscored this, uh, you know, on office parks, you know, integrating walking and jogging loops that are interesting, that are intentional, um, that are not just sort of the leftover space, that they are designed to be there. Connecting with nature, using all those beautiful wooded areas to get people outside for, for uh, mindfulness and, and sort of engaging with nature for that break at lunchtime. And outdoor fitness courts. More and more, especially during COVID, very popular, right? We can't have a lot of the indoor space and get the proper social distancing. Outdoor sport, outdoor fitness courts, um, very popular, very important. And fourth and final, amenitizing and programming. Now we have people outside, they're engaged, they're moving around, now let's give them something to do, right? So multi-use outdoor spaces, courts, outdoor ping pong, amphitheaters, all of these types of things that people experience in a downtown that's amenitized with public parks. Social spaces, or as we say now, socially distanced social spaces, but still great spaces where people can get together and sort of you know, build those uh, important relationships. And then flexible indoor outdoor spaces. And this is actually 200 Connell, the one that um, uh, Roger had mentioned earlier. And Gensler had designed, opened up this wall and designed this beautiful jewel box to really bring the inside outside. So to, to work with that, we designed this parking court, which again, going on this flexibility theme. This is a parking court, so day to day it's used for parking, but because of this indoor outdoor relationship, it can be used for programming, events, and a whole multitude of things if people need to be outside rather than inside. To the right, you can see the beginning of what's going to be a, an outdoor workplace. And uh, this is just finished construction, so I don't have any great photos of it, but here is the rendering. So this is, this is an, an outdoor shared workspace. So this is fully amenitized, Wi-Fi, electric. We have um, collaboration tables, several collaboration tables, single worker tables lounge spaces and social spaces, everything that you find in a great um, outdoor, in a great indoor workspace brought outside. Uh, so also a very important thing during COVID-19 to allow that flexibility. Now we take a lot of, the, a lot of those tenets are actually derived from the design of actual public streets, right? So now we can talk a little bit about um, the importance of flexible streets. And this is something that we've been doing for a very long time and encouraging for a very long time, which is how we use our public streets and using them really for more than just to move cars and move people. Um, so what we've found is that many of the towns that had been designed with flexible streets have thrived during COVID-19. And these, this is from people that have reached out to us and communicated that to us. So the three most important things of balance during COVID-19 of flexible streets, one, balancing the street. So giving enough space for pedestrians, wide sidewalks, then expanding the sidewalk space wherever we can. And we'll show you how you do that. Then finally, sharing the road, which we've all seen this, right? Streetery is the term is very popular now where they're closing streets and moving tables outside and things like this. But if a town is prepared for streeteries, prepared for, for a street to be converted into a plaza, um, it's in a much better position. So first, ample sidewalks, plenty of space outside of doors, plenty of space for people to window shop and mill about with still having proper social distancing. This is particularly important in tourist areas, right? So this is a beach town. This is uh, Ventnor, New Jersey, just south of Atlantic City where people are gonna do a lot more kind of milling about and window shopping, you need to have that space for them and allow people plenty of room to pass. So wide sidewalks, very important. 
In many cases, the wide sidewalks day to day, you know, look something like this. This is about a 20 foot wide sidewalk that we designed in Montclair, New Jersey. And during COVID, they're able to use that space and even day to day before COVID for outdoor dining. And this particular restaurant could get almost 100% capacity outside. Now that's, that's an incredible um, amenity for that restaurant. Expanding the sidewalk space. So now we have the nice wide sidewalks. Now, if there are areas where we wanna expand it a little more, we call these curb extensions or corner bump outs. Now, many of you may have heard of parklets, which is a temporary version of that. We promote the permanent version so that there is no permitting. There is no cost on the retailer. There is no cost on the restaurateur. When they wanna expand their space, they can simply do so at the drop of a dime. And so this is uh, Atlantic Avenue in Ventnor, New Jersey. Um, and when we, the, you can see this curb extension that occupies a parking space here, this allowed them to get five additional four tops, which for a small restaurant is a big deal. The first option that we presented them, to them was this. It did not have the expanded seating area. But then we showed them this and we said, hey, if you lose one parking space, you can pick up four or five tables outside. They said, there's no way the, the restaurants are gonna go for that. They want their parking. Needless to say, every single restaurant requested the additional tables outside in lieu of a parking space. And that is what we built. And they were lucky they made that decision. You know, we could have never seen this coming, but um, in COVID-19, this three block stretch of Atlantic Avenue thrived as a summer destination. And we were told that actually three new restaurants opened up in this stretch uh, during COVID-19. Uh, you could see here how these tables are sitting out on this plinth, which occupies a parking space. Um, now, what if we occupy the entire street? <clears throat> So this is a design that we did for Milburn, New Jersey, where we take this street and we make it so that it can be easily transformed into an outdoor plaza. So you can notice here, this is a concrete roadbed. This allows us to make it flat and make it feel like a plaza. Overhead string lights also help with that ambiance. So in the evening, this is what that looks like, a nice feel. Then during COVID-19, they're able to close that street and make it into an entire outdoor dining area. So restaurants that were located even around the corner could set up on this street and bring their food there and thrive during this event. They did this as a test fit in June and they ended up closing the street permanently through the end of October. And there are people requesting that it stays this way even when uh, COVID passes because of the concrete roadbed, they can do things like yoga. <clears throat> I'm sorry, there's a little, if there's a little delay on the slide, I apologize. Um, they can do things like yoga out on the concrete because the concrete does not get hot. We're able to make it flatter than an asphalt roadbed. Asphalt roadbeds need a little more slope. So it's nice and flat, perfect for your outdoor yoga classes. And this space has thrived uh, through this time period. And we believe that this is a trend and that if towns can prepare and can utilize this space um, at the drop of a hat, when events like this occur, they're well positioned. And even when they do not, they can provide uh, this unique experience and this additional space uh, for restaurants. So uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over uh, to, to Keenan. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and now we'll have a new CRE member, Brad Bowler, uh, do his presentation. Welcome, Brad. Good afternoon. So uh, we went through a number of things with regards to what we're seeing from an office experience and obviously street interaction. The question is, uh, how is that impacting the real estate market and development on the East Coast? So. Um, I'd like to take everyone through the first uh, few things that we're seeing from an approval perspective. Um, the biggest thing is that everyone, you know, had to work from home starting in end of March. Uh, and that didn't just include us, but it included the, the folks that work at governmental agencies and towns. So uh, what we've seen as a trend uh, as part of submissions and, and working through that process is that 
folks started to learn how to work from home and, and work on virtual settings, uh, reviewing PDFs, reviewing applications via email and submissions. That's been really helpful, uh, especially in a state like New Jersey, where traditionally large paper submissions would have to go into the, the towns and be distributed to, to the, the boards and professionals in the states. Now we're seeing a trend where folks are actually accepting email versions and, and submissions that help um, expedite the review. It also makes it more efficient and, and truthfully, it, it kind of goes towards the promotion of, of sustainability. Uh, reduction of paperwork and, and using electronic versions. Um, the also, it also helped with us uh, with enhancement of, of discussions with agencies. So when they had a review comment or board members had questions on an exhibit uh, during testimony or presentation, we were able to zoom in on that presentation uh, similar to what we're doing today with a, with a, a Zoom meeting uh, or um, uh, a, a plan set where it was traditionally hard to see what we were presenting to the board members or to the agencies. Now we can zoom in and have really enhanced conversations on, on our, our presentations. Uh, along those lines, uh, we are seeing hearings and meetings go virtual as, as most people are. Um, what, what that's actually helping us do is uh, prepare uh, a much more enhanced uh, pr presentation. Um, we can spend more time on exhibits and use our cursors uh, to present those applications. Um, we also uh, are seeing that a lot of the states didn't have laws that would allow for a legal presentation via Zoom, uh, especially in the state of New Jersey. Um, there was uh, some worry that uh, folks would appeal the applications that were, um, were presented through Zoom because they didn't have a proper mechanism uh, in the state laws to do that. So we're starting to see now where uh, Keenan and Roger and I and Dave are actually presenting via Zoom, and now it's, it's moving towards a legal uh, precedent for, for those meetings. Um, there are extra steps we have to take to present and prepare. Um, one is making sure you have proper Wi-Fi and internet connection, which is always a, a killer during a presentation, but it also allows you to present from other spaces where you weren't uh, able to do so for, for before. So if we're out of state and you had to travel into state, you don't have to worry about a plane being delayed for weather or renting a car or getting a hotel room. Folks can present uh, as, a, as a licensed um, professional from Chicago in New Jersey or in Arizona from New Jersey uh, as part of the, the process. And it makes it a lot easier for us to, to really address those items. Uh, it also allows us to kind of work with civic groups outside of uh, the hearing beforehand to show them what we're doing uh, with regards to um, our presentation and talk through those processes uh, as part of that process. Um, so. What we're also seeing in trends, and I wanna to work towards that, um, that was kind of the presentation part, is starting with restaurants. Um, I think that was probably the biggest impact for uh, folks in, in the, the immediate shutdown. So restaurants, you couldn't go into the, uh, the restaurant to, to, to purchase uh, food, um, but we did see a, a pretty large uptick in quick serve restaurants, uh, McDonald's, Starbucks, um, things like, uh, restaurants like those where they had drive-through. Uh, before COVID, I would say between 60 and 70% of the drive-through was, uh, was where the sales were based. Um, obviously with the shutdown of dining space and um, indoor, indoor seating or outdoor seating for that matter and quick serve restaurants, that ratcheted up to uh, a larger number, 95 to uh, 100% of the, the sales were going out of the drive-through. So for anyone that's driving by a, a fast food restaurant during COVID, you probably see a longer stack, which creates a lot of challenges for development uh, for the civil engineers and, and for planners and, and architects. Um, as the footprints get smaller, there's less folks that sit inside, more folks that want to use um, the drive-through. And also the transition to a Grubhub or Uber Eats where folks do order McDonald's, uh, other restaurants like an Olive Garden or, or, or quick casual sit down. Folks do order and have Uber Eats or Grubhub pick up their food. So there's a, a transition towards less parking spaces. The parking spaces that are geared towards uh, the site may be used for the, the, the quick pickup, uh, curbside pickup or Uber Eats. And then a, more of a focus on, on drive-through actually. Um, uh, for those geared towards restaurants. Uh, with regards to retail, um, that was also a fairly impacted uh, facility and, and Keenan mentioned this in his, in his opening. Uh, there's a transition that 
folks in the retail sector are really moving towards uh, less parking requirement uh, in the facility or in the in the, the strip mall. Uh, folks are gearing more towards curbside pickup. So uh, a retailer like a Dick's or a Home Depot, you can order online. Uh, they designate parking spaces out front. You know, you let them know when you're there for your order. Uh, an employee comes out, drops off your order in the back of your car, and then you're on your way. So you spend less time in the facility. You're occupying that space for maybe 10 minutes or five minutes, and you're on your way. Less of a demand. Uh, and then that leads to more of a repurposing of these facilities where when we can use uh, some of the excess parking spaces for pad sites like a drive through facility I just mentioned. There's also a trend that we see uh, starting to pick up as well as, as some of those bigger boxes need less space uh, or some of these retailers need less space. Uh, converting some of the space to a self storage facility. Um, some of them also going as extreme as putting residential in certain areas um, and making more of a mixed use community to kind of tie that in. So you have um, that, that feel that um, the Bell Works Lab was talked about earlier in a, in a retail facility where you have an incorporation of uh, different uses of parks that Dave mentions and really that activated space. So that someone comes to the facility or the retail facility and they don't just go there to pick up uh, a retail uh, entity or use. They go there to really experience what's going on. Will they have dinner? They might walk around and hang out outside. They might have a, an entertainment area that's it's all built into this, this retail facility. So more of a mixed use center now, and those are conversions um, in space. And then we hit the industrial market. So um, as soon as COVID hit, obviously there was a, a pretty big shortage of uh, products that were being shipped, but a big demand that picked up as people would not be able to go into retail centers and pick up needs the shortage uh, really kind of grew for space uh, and actual shortage of facilities that would be available to do this. And this is last mile. So the Amazon facilities, FedEx, uh, be able to deliver that package to your house, as well as warehousing for that matter for production and uh, housing of materials as they get ready to store. So there has been a pretty uh, heavy demand uh, in, the, in the local uh, tri-state area of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Connecticut, for warehousing growth. Uh, and that goes from you know, big warehouses to, for warehousing to the last mile distribution. Uh, and what we're seeing also is last mile distribution starting to take uh, smaller spaces within neighborhoods. Uh, Keena mentioned neighborhood demand. We see that from a delivery perspective as well. You, you really want your delivery folks driving less mileage in a, in a smaller radius and delivering those, those packages to houses as quickly as possible. And then the last thing we're seeing is, is Folks are, are looking out, outside the box. Traditionally, you would see people develop uh, older warehouse space or industrial space into the, the newer space, or they'll, they'll, uh, they'll look at doing a, a farm field and converting that into a warehouse space. Now we're seeing folks uh, look at movie theaters because there's a lot of parking, a lot of asphalt, uh, not a big demand for movie theaters, uh, looking at other facilities along those lines where there uh, may be a tired office space that's looking to, uh, you know, when there's an area that has a, a lot of office that's, that's vacant, we'll take one of those down and put uh, this uh, warehousing facility to kind of fill that need in that gap. Uh, mentioned a couple times, I think we saw on one of Dave's slides about residential and migration, how people are, are really moving towards different uh, lifestyles. And I think Roger mentioned this, their uh, folks are moving out of the cities because of the expenses for, for rent. We're seeing a lot of folks uh, want to buy new houses, single family, townhomes are in high demand in, in the suburbs. Uh, but they're still focused on transit oriented areas. So uh, apartments are still looking to be built in those areas. I think what's really leading us towards that route is that people still want the option to pop into the city once this the pandemic is over. Uh, they still may want to work in the city. So they may, might still want the option of taking a train in the city or into the cities. But they also want the option to be able to be out in some of the suburban areas where they have ability to, to work and play and, and walk to those areas and really use what Dave uh, designs in some of the smaller, you know, more suburban areas like a Montclair, uh, like, uh, like a Milburn, where you can get into the city pretty quickly for New York City, but you, but you also want to have the option to be walking in a small downtown area and really advance that, um, that home life balance. And the last thing we wanted to speak on was senior living. So um, a lot of the news um, that most folks saw was that there's a high level of 
you know, folks being impacted by the, the COVID virus in the senior living facility. So that really fo focused and forced the folks to, to look at how their facilities operate inside. Uh, do they have areas where they can quarantine folks in, in, in the event that there's a flu breakout in a facility? And that's been a, a, a review that we've seen uh, in our area, a reimagining of how those facilities work. We also look at um, demand in these facilities. So there has been a, a fairly strong demand in some of the states that need senior living in the next five years. But what we've seen is a slowdown because folks are a little reluctant as of right now until a, a vaccine is available to put the, the, their family members in a situation where it could be a, an impactful situation. But that's all, I think that's a, a short term uh, play. I really think that long term folks will still use these facilities as long as they're designed to, as appropriate for, um, for things like uh, flu outbreaks and stuff, stuff along those lines that might be impactful to the, to the, to the tenants. Uh, and that's all I had for, I guess, impacts to the retail development world. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, all right. So we have a little time here for a little q and I would encourage, again, um, all attendees, if you have a question, to please submit that via the Q&A function. Uh, one question I see here is, since outdoor space has become so important in site design for both office and retail, what measures are being undertaken from a design standpoint to protect these spaces and the employees slash patrons from bad weather, which is a big concern in New Jersey and throughout the Northeast and Midwest? Um, so anyone have thoughts on that, Roger, Dave? Did you say, um, I, I, did you say bad weather? Yeah. The idea being, okay, we're placing such an emphasis on outdoor space, but what about the six months of the year where arguably some of that may not be usable um, unless it's designed appropriately? Right. Yeah. I, you know, I think that um, extending the, 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 the seasonality of these spaces is very important. Um, it has been, you know, it has been something that, that, that's, that has been under consideration for a very long time. Um, in, uh, you know, I would say here, you know, in the Northeast, <clears throat> uh, it's not six months, you know, I think that, you know, we're, we're usually pretty good, you know, April, May, April to, you know, even now, like look where we are now, we're in November, it's 70 degrees outside. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I really think that it's a, it's kind of a three month period where, you um, you know, there, there, in the interim, there, there are things like the outdoor heat lamps and, you know, fire pits and things like this that are, that are built into these spaces. Um, but, um, but for the most part, you know, I think that, you know, if you're living in the Northeast and you're used to this, this type of thing, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is what we do. You know, you, you, you dress warm and you go out and you do it. Um, yeah. Of course, that's not going to be the case you know, you're not going to sit down and, and eat at a restaurant um, out, outdoors, you know, when, it, it, when it's, you know, 30, 40 degrees outside. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that there's much that we can do about that. Um, yeah. So I think that it's really, it's really maximizing that three season um, uh, capacity more than anything. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good point. Uh, this idea of maximizing the, the, the sort of seasonal access to outdoor space is important. I mean, we're seeing a lot of interest, for example, in opening up interior space of office buildings to outdoor space that exists so that even if you can't occupy the outdoors, you can, you can get fresh air into the interior of the, of the building. We're seeing some of that. Also, I think when it comes to, to campus planning, the idea of programming and, and, uh, and Dave has done a lot of this, uh, certainly at, at Connell, but in other places, where you actually program the outdoor spaces with a variety of, of structures that can allow for shelter if it's raining. So you can have access to a space and you have a certain amount of shelter. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a reality that, that you know, we're, we're not going to be out in the middle of the winter. But I think that we're seeing more and more of a premium being placed on health and wellness. And that means being outside that means having flexibility of choice in terms of programming indoors and out and i think it's a growing trend that certainly will continue post covid great yeah you know i found the some of the data that that roger had presented is in his presentation very interesting um obviously sort of landing on this hybrid model and you had talked about 
the future being a collection of spaces, you know, certainly for some of these larger corporate users. I'm wondering if, if you've heard or, or if you're anticipating, you know, in some of our smaller downtowns um, and, you know, local retail centers where we, where we are losing a lot of the brick and mortar retail tenants, you have a lot of vacancies, you know, are any corporations out there thinking about smaller scale satellite office locations? And also to the extent, you know, as a planner, there's oftentimes zoning limitations on ground floor office space. But is there a way to do that in a way that's engaging, you know, that perhaps even includes a small retail component, but is there as a, a satellite location for um, a corporate office user? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'd, I'd mentioned before is that a lot of, um, certainly in this region, a lot of New York firms are looking at, um, you know, other facilities, other spaces available to them that they can distribute their workforce. Um, in fact, what's interesting about it is that by, by creating other assets that are distributed, um, they can actually reach their workforce more readily. Those commuters who are commuting into New York every day, um, if they have a place to go um, near their communities, that becomes a very exciting option. It reduces, you know, it obviously it reduces carbon emission. It reduces the amount of commuter time and the stress related to that. All of those things are, are real possibilities. And, um, and to your point, your, your question about um, uh, smaller spaces in, in uh, taking over retail space, I think it's interesting. I mean, I know that, um, for example, in Morristown, where the M Station project was being developed, uh, it was very important actually to, to sort of develop the retail space. However, they, they do have codes that allow for active use so that, that um, if you have an amenity space that's a part of the office building that shows active use on the streetscape, that goes a long way to, to creating the energy on the street that uh, Dave was talking about. So I think that's also uh, very important. Great. Um just getting back to um, some of the, the streetscape improvements that we saw in Dave's presentation and a couple of the things that Brad touched on as well, it seems to me there may be some tension between, you know, taking over the streets as these new amenities, sort of in some ways privatizing the, the public realm in some cases. Um, but what about the fact that we have more demand now for curbside pickup? Um, in some cases for additional shipping activities that's occurring, you know, through the rise of e-commerce. How do we balance, you know, those demands in sort of a downtown setting with the desire to have more of a vibrant streetscape? Well, it's not easy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it's a great point. You know, I, I'm not sure that I have a clear answer for that, but um, what I do know is that um, the, the, the knee-jerk uh, reaction to losing loading space and losing parking um, is often very quickly resolved uh, when that activity is there, you know, and, and I think that that's, that's what's shown in almost every project that we do along those lines. Um, that they figure it out. Now, the, I think the increase in takeout and and the, the need for and pickup, um, you know, that's interesting. You know, it it, ha it hasn't come up. It hasn't come up for us um, yet, um, but it could. Um, but but what what we have found is that <clears throat> as soon as uh, people go downtown and it feels more bustling, you know, like you see in those images that energy spills over to many, many other places. So that single takeout meal is one, one buyer, one client in, out, in their car, gone. The person coming down to sit at that table that's outside of that restaurant is gonna get up and walk around and spend time and spend more money in other places. And that, so, so in terms of overall economic benefit, um, it, it, you know, there's always this knee jerk reaction about about pickup and parking and, and these things. And it's it's usually very quickly overcome um, by the, the 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 positive result of, of providing that that additional space outside. <clears throat> Excellent. OK, we have a, a question for this is for Roger. Um, projects such as Gateway were obviously planned prior to the pandemic. Are revisions being considered to account for distancing, 
de-densification, et cetera? Well, I think, I think every, every office, um, every landlord and every tenant uh, in these buildings are putting together plans to do this. I mean, most of us are still working from our couches and our, our kitchen tables, but the reality is that that will change over time. And ultimately, I think we'll come back to some sort of balance. But um, those, those are taking place. There are strategies that are being put, put in place, both in terms of the retail seating arrangements, in terms of the tenant responses to these issues. So all of that's, all of that's definitely happening uh, as a part of Gateway, and it's, and it's an important part of this. But one of the things at Gateway that is interesting, we put, we've created larger spaces for public gathering. And in the main entrance that you enter into from the train station, there's a large hall. And that hall allows that kind of flexibility we were talking about before, where you're able to use it for different purposes at different times. And the greater space uh, allows that, that social distancing to occur. But in addition to that, um, we've proposed um, the, the utilization of the streetscape. Gateway really didn't actively engage the street as, as it could have. And now the, the plans involve the activation of those kinds of active streetscapes that Dave's been talking about. That's so important to the vi vitality of these, these our communities. Great. Um, Brad, one for you. Um, it's something that I've had some experience with recently, but you had mentioned the, the value placed on having drive-through facilities in a lot of these restaurant locations. And that's something that's in many municipal jurisdictions, uh, either prohibited or very limited, you know, the ability to have drive through. In your experience, have you seen uh, a greater willingness or openness on the part of municipalities to drive through facilities? And likewise, you know, are you seeing uh, more demand on the private side? I'm sure you are, but from maybe even like non traditional type restaurants that maybe in the past weren't even considering drive through facilities. Yeah, so to answer your question about zoning, it's the towns have certainly been more willing to grant those variances, but I think typically a zoning code and Ken, you can probably agree with me is reactionary as opposed to being proactive and how people interact in the world. So as drive throughs become, you know, more prevalent and needed, uh, especially nowadays, you know, 35 years ago, drive throughs were the worst thing you could de design in the world. Um, now they're pretty commonplace and people like them. And now we're showing that people really want to just use a drive through to pick up their Starbucks or their McDonald's. So I think that you'll see zoning codes over the next 10 years, probably trans transition into adding requirements for more drive throughs and, and maybe even reducing parking demands for those types of QSRs. Uh, along the lines of drive throughs on non-traditional, yeah, I think you're gonna see some more folks uh, move towards that route where you have like a Panera who's not as quick as a, a traditional fast food restaurant. They start to add drive-throughs. They were doing that before pandemic. Now they're adding more of them. I think you see a lot, uh, you know, convenience stores will add drive-throughs potentially. You have a quick check, a Wawa 7-Eleven might be adding those as well. So I think you're gonna see a lot more drive-throughs added to help out with, the, you know, picking up the curbside pickup, the pickup on, uh, on orders on your, on your app. Okay, great. I think we'll make this the last question. I see one more coming through on the chat. Um, and this is, I think measuring the economic success of additional space in the street for pedestrians is important to make these positive changes permanent post COVID. Are there measures you are taking to track the success of projects you are working on? Um, and since we give Dave all the tough questions, we're going to ask him to, to deal with this one first. Um, so it, it, I saw that one come through. It's, it's a great, it's super important, right? And um, the short answer is, is we haven't yet, you know, we haven't um, done that yet. Um, we have done, we have had situations where we've projected the sort of positive economic benefit, you know, using um, <clears throat> um, assessors and things like that. With this, we have not done that yet. Every, everything that we have right now, because it's it's so new, everything that we have is anecdotal. But um, it's certainly something that we're that we're that we would like to do. Um, and we're speaking to you know different business improvement districts and things like that to figure out how we can do that. But um, yeah, well, I would say, I mean, certainly to the extent we've seen municipalities already make a lot of this permanent. You know, in New York City. You know, other municipalities where you have the restaurant lobby, they're, you know, they're out there 
telling the mayor every day how great this is and how they want to make it permanent, you know, some of that I would have to say speaks to the economic impacts of, mm. of you know, devoting some of this public space to, to these uses. So I would say there's there's two there's there's two sides to that right and this is what we've seen right so there's there is an advocacy side to street design right where there are people that are advocates for pedestrian oriented streets that does not always jive with the economic vitality of those streets right so so it's both so it really is both and and you have to listen to both and um, because we have been in situations even recently, like now with this, there is a, there are a lot of people, you know, because there are these little tests, then the, then some advocates jump on and say, well, we should make this permanent, you know, and and maybe the data isn't there yet. Um, so so I think so, sometimes, it, you know, I think we have we definitely have to be careful about it um, and, 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 and honest about it. Um, about the successes and and really the way to do that is to talk to the business owners and 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 and, and get the data, um, but because this is all you know a lot of it's new and um, and you know it's uh, this is designing streets right this is like a, the core of our business and it's like it's much more complicated than you would think you know there's so many stakeholders involved in a street ranging from utilities to store owners to pedestrians to commuters and you know, thinking about all of those things together is, uh, is, is very, very important as we kind of inch forward out of uh, this unique kind of COVID situation. Excellent. Okay, well, to be continued, I want to thank uh, each of our panelists for their insights. Uh, thank all the attendees for spending an hour with us this afternoon. We hope you found this an interesting and stimulating discussion. There's obviously a lot here. So uh, thanks, Art, and the chapter, and uh, all the folks in Chicago for hosting us. You know, and on behalf of the chapter, I, I'd like to thank you, Keenan, for putting your effort uh, into, into all of this, and Dave, and Brad, and uh, Roger. Great discussion, very informative, and uh, I hope we can do it again. Uh, maybe we get an update in a year and see, uh, and see how all of this is panning out. You might have some data by then to see how things are working out. So thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, to everyone who attended, thank you as well. So take care. Thanks. All right. Be well. Thank, thank you, you all. all.